two weeks, on a scale of one to four, have you felt like you've lost interest in your hobbies? Have you been eating more or less than usual? Have you felt sad? Finally, have you felt like harming yourself? These were the questions a psychiatrist asked my best friend three years ago when he suspected that she may be suffering from depression. Based on her answers, he concluded that she had minor depression, but she was well enough to go home with a prescription for antidepressants. Two days later, my friend tried to take her own life. Now, I wish I could say that this is a unique or a highly unusual situation. But unfortunately, the reality is it's not. Millions of people around the world remain undiagnosed with depression. Or when they are diagnosed, they can face up to 10 years of trial and error until they land on the right treatment. But what my friend psychiatrist did was use the best tools he had to hand. These types of questions and clinical observation are the gold standard for assessing depression. So, how did this gold standard fail my friend? Well, to answer that question, I'd like you to imagine a slightly different situation, one in which my friend or anyone here in the audience was suspected of having diabetes, not depression. In this case, although your clinician may start with questions, they probably wouldn't stop there. They would move on and take your blood pressure, and then they would ask for things like blood tests and urine tests. They would then compare your results to the results of someone with diabetes and someone without. And it would be based on that comparison that they would judge whether you should be diagnosed as having diabetes and whether you should start treatment or not. Can you see the massive difference here? For physical health, in the past 100 years, we have had an absolute revolution in the form of tools that can help clinicians with more consistent and more objective metrics of physical illness. Tools like blood pressure cuffs, thermometers, blood tests, urine tests, mammograms, x-rays, and so many more. All of these are able to detect so thousands of sometimes tiny signals of physical illness known as biomarkers. Now, biomarkers can be incredibly powerful when they're used well, because they can help clinicians identify conditions and treatments incredibly efficiently. But unfortunately, for mental health, there is no such thing as a blood pressure cuff or a thermometer for depression. But the solution to this problem may be staring us in the face, quite literally. What if I told you that the way in which our faces and our eyes move could in fact be used as biomarkers for depression? What if I told you that the way you speak or the way you behave inside of something as seemingly trivial as a video game could actually reveal not just whether you have depression, but also many other mental health conditions. Over the past 12 years, I have looked at how different people use and understand language. As a neuroscientist with a specialty in linguistics, I've examined whether patients use words and structures differently to people that do not have a condition. It turns out the answer is yes. My research is part of a much, much bigger movement that has found that things like the number of personal pronouns you use, or the intonation of your voice, or the way sometimes your voice cracks, all of these things are highly accurate signals for depression. Moving beyond that, though, looking at somebody's face and examining things like the arch of your eyebrow or the way that the corners of your mouth move when you smile, these are also significantly correlated 
with many mental health conditions, not just depression. When I saw my friend experience depression, I resolved to find a way to bridge the gap between all of this amazing research and clinical reality, to create a solution for a problem faced by her, but also millions of others. I combined my expertise with that of my co-founder, Dr. Stefano Gorea, an expert in artificial intelligence. And together, we created Themia. Inspired by the fact that even in her darkest times, my friend found comfort in video games, we decided to use this very same medium to gather the biomarkers we needed from patients. You see, although you may not think that a video game is the obvious solution here to track mental health, the reality is games are incredibly flexible. A video game is simply an engaging interface built around a set of winning and losing rules. So we decided to build video games where the rules are based on validated neuroscience experiments. Using these games, we're able to gather all of the information we need from patients. We can track a player's speech patterns, their facial expressions, and their behavior inside the game. We then compare this behavior to that of thousands of patients and healthy volunteers. And based on that comparison, we can see whether someone may indeed have depression, but also whether treatment is working for them. So, how do these games actually work? Well, although everyone experiences depression slightly differently and for very different reasons, there are certain common elements among everyone with depression. Common patterns in thinking and in behavior that have to do with the slight differences in how their brain works. Broadly speaking, there are two big categories of depression signals. One category are depression traits. Now, these are highly consistent patterns Regardless of whether you're in a high mood or a low mood, these patterns will always be there. For this reason, if you're able to actually see these patterns, you can help find out whether someone should be diagnosed with depression or not. The other big category are depression states. Now, these are very different. These patterns fluctuate depending on whether you're in a low or in a high mood. For this reason, if you can actually track these, you can tell whether somebody's responding well to treatment or not. So if you are able to track both of these types of signals and you can combine them, you can get an excellent overview of not just whether someone does have depression or not, but also whether a treatment is working for them or not. Here, you can see an example of a game targeting numeric short-term memory. You need to click the screen whenever you see a number that matches a previous number. This is an example of a depression trait game. No matter whether you're experiencing a low or a high mood, if you have depression, we would expect you to behave in a very specific way. Over here, on the other hand, we have a speaking game. This is different. We're asking you to describe a scene that changes as you speak. This is a depression state game. Here, depending on whether you are in a high or in a low mood and whether you're responding well to treatment or not, the words and the structures you use to describe the scene will actually be very different. Using features like these, we have indications that we would be able to track depression symptoms with over 90% accuracy. In fact, some research has shown that for other conditions like ADHD, you could actually diagnose them using tools like these with over 95% accuracy. So imagine the next time you go into your doctor's office, instead of them asking you to rate whether you're in a low or in a high mood and how much, you could actually play a video game that would object objectively benchmark that for you. But using tools like these, could actually have far more widespreading and positive impacts that you may at first think. I mean, absolutely. These tools can empower clinicians to find the right treatment and to diagnose way quicker. And that is fantastic in and of itself. But let me take you one step further. 
think about how these objective metrics could impact the stigma surrounding mental health. When was the last time you heard someone say, oh, my friend doesn't have type 1 diabetes, she just needs to snap out of it? Or, no, 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 my brother doesn't actually need insulin, it's all in his head. I am a very firm believer that in the same way that you shouldn't blame someone for having diabetes and requiring insulin, you shouldn't blame someone for having depression or having bipolar disorder and requiring treatment for it. And from where I stand, an excellent first step in that direction is creating these objective empirical measurements of mental health conditions and symptoms. Measurements that cannot be argued against. Measurements that show that this is not simply inside someone's head. My aim here today isn't to berate or to tear down the mental health system in any way, but rather to highlight the potential for how much more we can achieve with tools like these. My hope is that more and more objective biomarkers will be found for mental health, and they will be made available to expert clinicians, not in order to replace their judgment in any way, but rather to supplement and to bolster it, in the same way that a thermometer or a blood pressure cuff can aid a clinician but never actually replace them, tools like ours should be used safely, always alongside the judgment of an expert clinician. And hopefully, one day very soon, when someone like my friend does experience depression, they don't slip through the net in the same way that she did. Thank you.